Hey guys, this is Hunter Levine, and thank you for listening to the Captain's Collective. Every episode, we sit down with a different captain or some sort of fishing industry leader and get to hear some amazing stories while trying to mine out the best content possible. I just want to give a big thanks to everybody who's been following the project. We're having an awesome time with this podcast, and we hope that it's something that you enjoy and find helpful. To subscribe to the podcast or to sign up for our newsletter, head to captainscollective.com or follow along on iTunes, Stitcher, wherever it is that you're listening to this. And in today's episode, we sit down with Tom Rowland of the Tom Rowland Podcast and the television show Saltwater Experience and talk about fitness, the myth of finding balance in life, how to build a business, and what makes a great angler. Outside of filming 14 seasons of Saltwater Experience, Tom also guided for roughly 20 years with experience in both fresh and saltwater. This episode was recorded between an Econo lounge and some sort of country Chinese fusion buffet and is filled with all the bustling sounds of Live Oak, Florida. You'll definitely hear some interesting things here to there in the background, but I know that you're going to enjoy it. And thank you again for listening. This is the Captain's Collective. Success is a gift. Excellence is the only thing to strive for. Uh, yeah, he, he, right. tried he tried to eat it. He tried to eat it. Hit him, hit him, hit him, hit him. He got him. He's on. Got uh, two butt caps off the rods, filled them with tequila. We took a shot and out we went. There, there ain't no getting into it after that. It's, you're, you're hooked. It's a bad habit. And all the time, flips the, and he's standing there ready to go for a tarpon. Any time, I said, you talk so much, you're like a senator. Thanks so much for being on the podcast, sure. Tom. Grateful to have you here. Before we get going, you mind just telling us where you're heading and what you got going on? Um, well, I'm going from the Miami Boat Show, and I'm headed back up to Tennessee. I'm going to go see my son in uh, Belmont. He's um, he's there. Going to hang out with him a little bit, and um, you know, get ready for turkey season. Nice. Is that what you guys are going to be doing up there in Belmont? Uh, no, he goes to school there, so we're gonna. He's all, he's all into this climbing gym and uh, really loves the climbing gym and it's got a CrossFit component to it and a climbing component to it. So he wants me to come check that out. So I'm gonna go up there and um, spend a little time with him and uh, go to his climbing gym. Work on the grip strength a little bit. That's something, it's funny you mentioned that because that was something we wanted to talk about. I know you travel with workout gear. Yeah, And uh, what what do you have with you right now? Um, Right now, well, I have a kettlebell in the back that apparently came unleashed because I've, I've felt it and heard it um, rattling around like a cannonball in the back of my truck. Um, but I usually carry uh, a minimal amount. The deck of cards workout is my favorite um, travel workout. It's a very simple one. You just eat, you give uh, exercise, or each suit you give an exercise. So there's four suits. So you either have two or four exercises and then like uh, um, face cards are 10, aces are 11. So you turn it over, it's, you know, spades or burpees or whatever. So um, you turn it over, it's a two of, two of spades, that's two burpees. Turn over the next card, it's five of hearts, that's five sit-ups. And so that's my go-to travel workout. And then I'll bring a kettlebell. Uh, when you hit a joker, you'll throw in something else. So a joker might be a mile run, or it might be, you know, 50 kettlebell swings, or it might be something else. So I'll keep the, the kettlebell in there so I can have some weights. But mostly when I'm on the road, I usually do body weight workouts and running um, as much as I can. How long do you try to keep the workouts lengthwise? Um, while I'm on the road or when I'm Yeah, when you're on the road. Um, it just, you know, so much depends on what's going on. Like I, I try almost always to get it in before whatever we're doing. So if we're doing a, a shoot, you know, sometimes we're, le- you know, the, it, the meetup time is you know, 6.30 at the dock or whatever. So that means that I need to have gotten up at four and put in an hour and then I'll be back at five. I can shower. I can, you know, make sure I got the right clothes on the right mindset or whatever to, to head into to that day. So if it's earlier, then that obviously means I got to get up earlier. At some point across the line, if we're going to leave it, you know, if it's going to be a four o'clock meet or something like that, then that's going to be an afternoon workout. But for the most part, I like to do it in the mornings if I can. 
and obviously it's good just to be healthy and to work out, but there's a component to that. I think there's a great direct correlation with being on the boat and everything that you're doing. How have you found fitness and holistic fitness to kind of help well, you with that? That's what started it all for me, really. Um, I, I guess I kind of, I mean, I was an athlete in high school. Wrestling was my sport. And um, and then in the summers, I would swim on the on the swim team. And, and so I was very you know active and and athletics were a big part of my life and then I decided I wasn't going to wrestle in college and when I went to college I didn't do anything I mean I I just left all that behind and I think a lot of a lot of athletes especially wrestlers do because wrestling man I mean it is it is a grind it is a very very difficult sport and when you throw in the the combination of cutting weight and and you know all of the discipline and the practices and the summer camps and everything that you have to do to to wrestle at an elite level when you finally decide okay i'm done with that and i'm fine with being done with that which is where i was when i decided that i was going to not not going to pursue it in college i think that you you know it's like you welcome getting fat and you welcome like not hurting all the time and you welcome you know not having a black eye for nine months and and all of that stuff is is uh you know it's a welcome change because it's the first time in your life that you haven't really stepped on the scale every single day so it's like in, i went to college and got out of shape and i welcomed being out of shape and then started my fishing career and it wasn't until uh my wife and I started thinking about having children that I was like, man, I got to do something about this. Cause like, I'm not feeling that great. It's, you know, going out on the boat for five days in a row is difficult. Um, I'm going to obviously need to work way more than that. Like, you know, you, you, when you start to, to have children or, or develop a family as a fishing guide, man, everything changes. Like, really everything changes because it's fine you, you know you can work 120 130 days as a skiff guide and 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 do fine uh you know you can live in a modest place and you're rich i mean basically you you got a you it's a very simple lifestyle you got a boat to pay for you got a truck and you're getting paid in cash a lot and you know it's great but then when you start you know, you, you try to have that same lifestyle with a with a wife or and then, then a growing family, things change and you have to work a lot. And um, so that's really the road to fitness for me was necessary because I wasn't able to work enough physically to um, really support my family. So I started running, I started getting in better shape than the, and I started losing, you know, all the weight that I had gained. And, um, I just found that, okay, well now I can easily go two weeks without a break. Now I can easily go three weeks without a break. It wasn't long before I was booking every day of the year, you know, I mean, years went by of, of this fitness, but for me, it was, it was so much that, um, the better shape I was in and the better I took care of myself in the sun. The more energy I had, the more days I could go, the better my attitude was on the boat, the better my communication skills were on the boat. Um, and it all resulted in happier clients and happier clients rebook and rebooking clients make for a successful fishing guide. And, um, and the foundation of all of that was, was fitness for me. I mean, it's not that way for everybody, but it, it definitely was for me because I, I looked at being a professional fishing guide as being a professional athlete. like you know you got to take care of your body and if you are taking care of your body your body will do things for you that other people's bodies won't and so I mean I would go on a lot of days that other people weren't going and I would book really wouldn't take any days off I mean days off were weather days so um, that that all starts with fitness and then it just became a habit you know it just becomes a, a habit that that is a daily daily kind of thing so and that's that's kind of a mindset that you have to put yourself in. Uh, me and Hunter were joking on the way here 
we, we've named you kind of the Jocko Willink <laughs> of the fishing no, world. Uh, Those are big <laughs> shoes to fill. I mean, you're talking about getting up, you know, you got to meet somebody at 6.30 at the ramp, you know, getting up at 4 just to work out. That's not really, you know, I work out when I'm at work because there's nothing else to do. You know, it's hard for me to take a day that I'm going to go fishing and get up and work out before then. Well, it, it do you have kids? Not yet. Okay, well, there it is. Because <laughs> when you have you know when you don't have kids the workout comes you're like okay well I'll just do it in the afternoon and you have that time when you have kids and you're operating on a schedule that um, that doesn't allow for flexibility at any time of the day all of a sudden what happens is uh, you come home and and there's a play practice or there's a wrestling tournament or there's soccer game or there's something else and then you know as for me, I started coaching all of these activities and, and stuff like that, so you pile even more on it. You don't get it in today. Tomorrow, it's the same kind of thing. There's something else that happens. And next thing you know, you've gone four or five days without doing it. And for me, that's not good for my physical health. It's not good for my mental health. I mean, I almost the older I get, the more I realize that, that the workouts for me are almost more mental than they are physical. And, um, and they make me way more balanced, you know, and, and I'm better at everything because of it. I'm a better husband, I'm a better father, I'm a better fishing guy, I'm a better television host, I'm a better podcaster, better whatever, whatever it is that, that I'm doing. It almost seems like the fitness aspect of, of it has become just the foundation of everything. And, and when that slips, if it ever does, and it really, it doesn't anymore because I have come to this realization that without that, everything else suffers. And there was a really tough time for me to try to figure out, you know, when you got little kids and you're, you're trying to spend as much time at home as you can, how do you fit this in? And when is it becoming selfish? Like I started training for marathons and stuff like that. And that requires a lot of time. And and these long runs on on a Saturday and of course I was I was fishing and then I'd get back and then take a two-hour run and that is you know at some point that starts to borderline on being selfish and but but I had to you know really think about that a lot and it was kind of like okay I'm coming to terms with this because I can see this and I'm going to have to communicate this to my wife and I'm going to have to communicate this to my family. It was easy for my family because I had these running strollers and I put both my boys in there and then my daughter when she was when she was young too, but I had a double jogging stroller. So it actually worked great because I would get home from fishing in the afternoons and uh, my wife's been with the kids all day and it's like, here, take them and I would be like, great. And so we would go running and, and that worked well until they got to a certain age to where there are all these afternoon activities and other things that get in the get in the way of getting that run in and they don't want to ride in the stroller anymore you know they're they're they want to actually run or ride their bikes with me well i just had to make it a morning a morning routine but um it's a it's a delicate balance to try to figure out like am i being super selfish and i'm trying to do this for myself or am i or am i doing this because i feel like i'm going to be a better uh, member of this family if I'm in better shape and I have <laughs> nice <laughs> <a> motorcycle <laughs> uh, if I'm in better shape and I have this uh, this priority of taking care of myself so that then I can take care of other people in my life better and that's that's where it kind of sits with me and you talk about that balance piece I mean you're, you're a humble guy but ever since I was you know watching outdoor television I've watched shows with you on them or with the saltwater experience you know you got the television you got you know all sorts of you got the podcast going you got a lot of things going on but I can tell even just from our few conversations that family is a really big priority for you and so you got all these different things that you're kind of juggling but what advice would you give to people who they're trying to run a business they're trying to you know, fish and stay healthy. What, what type of advice would you give them for trying to find that balance in their life and with their families? Well, I don't know if I'm the best person to give advice on finding balance because it's a tricky thing. I think, I think that in, in order to be successful, your life has to be way out of balance for a certain amount of time. And the real trick to 
ha- to being successful in your business and in your family and in your marriage is to it's not finding balance it's find it's making sure that everybody understands what's going on and it make it's making sure that your wife understands okay at this point in our life we really have to buckle down and we're we're trying to buy a house and that means that you know if if we want certain things we're going to have to do certain things and if you if you want um you know if if you want things that other people i don't know if you want things you're going to have to do things that other people aren't willing to do and the there is a real delicate balance to making sure that everybody's getting the time that they need while your business is also getting the time that it needs and there for a while you've got to be way out of out of balance and it has to go like as far as being a fishing guide it has to go to to an obsessive just level that that most people don't understand that i mean you your mind is racing as you're going to sleep where am i going to fish what's the tide doing what's the wind doing oh the wind just changed directions what is that going to mean for my whole plan tomorrow how is this all going to work you, you know and and you're losing sleep over it even though you're physically completely exhausted and i mean i don't know it's not a balance later once that you have developed the clientele, once you have, have developed your reputation, later you can, you can back off and take weekends off and start to make a balance out of your life. But, but in the beginning, man, I guess I suggest not getting married because that's not the time. That's the time that you go nuts and, you, and everyone around you is... is is looking at you like you're completely insane even the other fishing guides even the other people that are in your business or whatever you have this unbelievably crazy work ethic that no one else can keep up with and i don't think that's the time to get married honestly i think once that you know and and this is the tricky thing too is once you're in that going nuts and just working and and at night you're working on your tackle when other people are going out and at night you're you're you know studying charts and or or studying whatever your business is and you're not doing these other things how are you meeting someone that you're going to spend the rest of your life with that's a real trick too is that you know you kind of got to get out there to meet someone and if all you're doing is working you know you're you're probably not going to meet that person. Yeah. You know, <laughs> so, I mean, there's so much balance and fi- finding this, this balance. But for the most part, I mean, I guess that's a long way to answer your question is that when you're first getting started and you're trying to do something that somebody else hasn't done before, or you're trying to make a, make yourself successful or you have goals or aspirations, it's probably not the time to try to come up with this super balanced lifestyle because that's going to be a recipe to being mediocre, honestly. That's a great point. And some good advice that was given to me too uh, was there was an article that was once sent to me and it talked about the myth of balance. And it talked about really, you know, we have this idea that we got to balance everything perfectly and have all the right, you know, time allocations for each thing. And really what I'm beginning to notice more and more too is that a lot of Uh, a theme that I'm seeing is a passion or like a determination that people have. And they just apply that passion in every aspect of life, whether it's waking up and working out, whether it's on the boat, whether it's being at home. And I know that's how my wife is like for her. It's not, I need you to spend 10 hours a day with me for her. It's, I I want you to be present when you're here. I don't want you to be one of those husbands that comes home and gets on Instagram and doesn't pay attention to me, you know, to come home and, and to, and to say, how was your day? How are you doing? And I even love what you mentioned. You know, you would get off the boat and you recognize that you could work out. You could run with your kids. You could serve your wife because that gives her some time to anybody that's spent a, a full day with a child understands that. <laughs> and, you know, so I think that that's, that's definitely a thing that you can notice is just this determination, this kind of ability to get after it. And that was something we were talking about as we were driving over here to meet. You know, I can tell you started this podcast a year ago, the Tom Rowland podcast. Yeah. 
And I can tell that you are taking it serious and you're getting after it and you're putting out a lot of good content. You're probably putting out the most content that I've seen in the outdoor space and it's good content. It's with, you know, great names, great anglers and, and uh, a pretty good variety of people. How, how have you um, tried to guard that passion or that intensity and not lost your edge over the years? Mm. Um, those are all good questions. Um, well, I don't know that you lose your edge if you, if you are truly passionate about it. And, and so that's never been a problem. Like for me, that, that the passion aspect is, it's there. It's, it's real. It doesn't seem to be going away. And pretty much whatever I do, I'm either all in or all out. So whether that's fishing or fitness or hunting or parenting or, or you know, podcasting or whatever, if I'm, the recipe for me to be unsuccessful is to be me to be uninterested. And then the successful part, I mean, I don't know if you call a podcast successful just because you put out a whole bunch of stuff. I mean, people seem to like it. I enjoy doing it. It's very easy for me um, in comparison to the other things that, that I do because it's just me. Um, it's a, it's one little box that I have sitting over here. There are no other schedules. There's no other crew. There's no other anything. And, and for me, it's an opportunity to sit down with a lot of people that for the most part, I haven't spent that much time with, or maybe I did in the past in the form of, um, like, uh, um, going out and fishing all day and, at the time that we were doing this it was the time you know times before cell phones were there so you know we used to talk about all kinds of stuff on the boat and for me the podcast is not unlike taking someone fishing hmm. say in the Everglades or the Marquesas where maybe you don't have cell phone reception and so it's just two people on the boat and you talk about everything under the sun from parenting to Sasquatch to you know, funny things that happen to people bearing their souls and telling you this stuff that they don't tell anyone else. And a fishing guide all of a sudden becomes a therapist and a and and somehow with your lack of business experience, you somehow become a business coach and somehow to, to CEOs, which is a very strange thing, they're asking you what your opinion of their <laughs> giant business is. And you're like, dude, I don't know. And they're like, well, that's why I'm asking because it's fresh eyes and it's like a different unique perspective and everyone around them is trying to tell them what they want to hear and they're like what do you think about this I'm like i don't know it doesn't make any sense to me at all and they're like that's nobody's telling me that mm. like what does make sense and like, man why are you asking me i'm just i'm just pushing this boat with a stick like <laughs> I don't, hey i don't, I don't know, know. There, there's a fish at 10 o'clock <laughs> yeah but i mean there is this thing that that you develop these relationships with these people and they trust you and they realize that you're not you're not asking anything from them you don't want anything from this other than for them to have a good time today and so they sometimes take that as this is a good opportunity to ask about this thing that's bothering me i guess i don't know yeah but you know i think that that goes into if you sit down with somebody and have a good conversation with them long enough man you end up talking about a lot of things that maybe you didn't intend to when you first sit down that's a great point that's a good parallel too between you know the being out on the boat and the long form conversation and questions that people ask and then just the nature of television which I think the TV shows are fantastic and I really like when you guys do something like here's a nod or here's how we do the leader set up and but you also have all the aesthetic that you need in there too you know we, you see the fish jump or see the fish fish feed well you're serving a lot of masters on the TV show and that's one of the reasons why I particularly like the podcast because I mean if we have a great conversation I can make that a two-hour show I can make it a 30-minute show it doesn't matter I mean it there's no there are no rules in television, there are very specific rules. It needs to be 22 minutes and 30 seconds long. There needs to be three three breaks, three, it's a three-part show. There's gonna be commercial breaks throughout. And there is a, I mean, there is a, a very defined deal. You send it in a different way and it comes back to you. 
right? Like there's quality control and, you know, each network's a little bit different, but for the most part, you're producing a 22 minute and 30, 30 second show. Within that, there are billboards and there are, um, you know, features and there, there are the bumps to the break and there's the open graphic and there's all this stuff. And it boils down to about maybe 10 minutes of fishing. And if you have a guest, it's even worse because now you have to tell their story. So that cuts into the fishing time. So that's one of the reasons why we don't have a lot of guests because what I notice is sometimes that makes for a great show, but oftentimes that cuts into the action and, and we already have barely any action. And, you know, even if you have a great day of fishing, you catch five or six tarpon, say, the chances of getting all that in the show, I mean, most of that doesn't make it. And <laughs> so that's kind of frustrating. Um, but you're, you're, you're always trying to walk the fine line between, you know, entertainment, you have to serve the fans, you have to produce a show that is interesting and fun to watch. You have to, I mean, there's a sponsorship element of it. So you have to do a good job for the sponsors. You have to do a good job for the location. You have to represent all of these things well. And in doing that, you also have to fit it into this 22 minute and 30 second pre predetermined format. It's hard to do. I mean, and then the other thing that's hard to do is you go out fishing, but it's nothing like going out fishing. Uh, you have a camera boat, you've got, you know, a lot of personnel over there. You're moving people between the boats. It's very challenging to catch anything, but people find, people sometimes find that to be the most interesting thing to talk about. And that's one of the questions that people ask a lot is, you know, how do you film a TV show? It seems like that would be really hard. It is, but that's honestly the easiest part of the whole business the hardest part of the whole business is keeping everything going from year to year um, the easiest part's actually going out there and catching fish even though that's monumentally more difficult than it is if just me and you go out me and you guys go out we're going to be able to you know enter this spot perfectly the way it should be if we got to fish into the sun a little bit so be it with the cameras, you can't do that. Like the the guys are back there going, no, I can't. This is a terrible shot, you know. <laughs> so you got to go around the other way, and like, wow, never done that before. <laughs> and it seems like it's not going to be possible, but and most of the time it's not. And but sometimes you can, you know, go real slow around, and now you're in the same position on the other side of the school of fish or on the other side of the single tailing bone fish, and sometimes they stay there. I mean, I've learned a lot like that about about patience and what's possible and things that that I thought were completely impossible. Eh, if you go slow enough and you try, you can find that you can make some of those things happen. You guys are out there like, you know, catching tailing bonefish is just too easy. We need to add some more factors in this. Thing. <laughs> Man, I'll tell you, it's not too easy. And uh, but I, I can say that there have been some situations that. I have seen happen that I would have, I would have told you that's completely 100% impossible before I've seen it happen. Like, well, we had a, <clears throat> we had a um, school of redfish and it was one of the better shows that we've ever filmed. And it was early morning, slick calm, and these redfish are just tailing and it's a big area of them. Well, we approach it to where the shot's terrible. So we have to go all the way around this school of fish. I didn't think it was gonna be possible for one boat to go around I, and certainly not for two boats to go around it, but we did it once and then we thought okay well wouldn't it be cool if we had the camera boat on one side and the fishing boat on the other so the camera guys are shooting down light we're looking into the light but we can see these fish well enough and you set up this situation to where it couldn't have been done better but if you had told me that's what we were going to do that morning 
I would have been like, let's just go somewhere else because that there's no way. I mean, if that's if that's what we're trying to do with all these boats and all these people, it's just not going to happen. I mean, these fish are in very shallow water. They're spooky. You know, one slammed hatch, you could see them. They all, they blow, and um, but it can happen. Props and it did to happen. the camera guys too for being quiet and <laughs> stealthy. Yeah. No, I mean you got to have a good team out there for sure. But I don't know. I mean I've just seen a lot of things that that I would certainly not have thought were possible. And um, it's it's kind of like okay, uh, I don't know. When we first started it, um, we were in this tournament mindset where we were just trying to catch as many fish as fast as possible. And our camera guy and producer kind of pulled us aside and was like, look, I know you guys can catch a lot of fish, but it doesn't matter if you catch a lot of fish if the shot's bad. Like, if you want to make a good show, you need to rethink everything. And you need to think about, okay, do we have the camera guys in the right place? Is catching one fish and documenting it, documenting it well that that beats catching a hundred fish where you're too far away or the camera's all shaky or you know whatever so we had to really rethink that and it was hard because you know how does how does catching one fish feel successful (laughs) you know i mean like that doesn't when when you know maybe you were out the day before pre-fishing or or on charters recently you've been just killing them and so now you're trying to catch one it's a totally different mindset but that's what it is it's a mindset and then that's a victory it's kind of like kind of like the difference between a regular charter and um filming or or a regular charter and then being in a fishing tournament like if you're in a fishing tournament it doesn't matter how many tarpon you jump makes no difference whatsoever but that in a charter that makes your client super happy. Oh, I jumped seven today. It was great. Best day I've ever had. It doesn't make any difference that he didn't land one. It was almost better that he didn't land one because it was more action. Yeah. But in a tournament, you do that, and you got a zero, a goose egg on the board. So, you know, that's a different mindset of it doesn't matter how many we hook. It doesn't matter, you know, what how many we see. It doesn't matter how beautiful the sunrise was. The only thing that matters is getting that fish to the boat, getting it taped properly, taking a picture, whatever you got to do. And if you don't do that, you got to, you got to goose egg. That's how we had to start thinking about the television show is, okay, is, are the cameras in the right place? Is the light correct? Is everybody happy before we catch this fish? And then that's a victory at that point. So I don't know, just a different different mindset so taking all those factors from that tv show that you're talking about has that in any way taken taken away some of the joys of fishing for you (laughs) it doesn't it does it turn it into work instead well it's definitely work there's no question that it's work but i think that the only reason that i say that it it hasn't taken away anything from it for me because i see it as it almost exactly the same journey as when I was just an angler and was interested in being a guide because I loved fishing and it didn't take very long to realize that if you're going to be a good fishing guide you're not going to do a lot of fishing you need to be a good fishing guide and you need to embrace that role as your as the guide it doesn't matter how well you can cast it doesn't matter how if you can catch that fish none of that matters whatsoever the only thing that matters is that you communicate to your customer in a way that they can understand and they can catch that fish the fact that you can catch it is meaningless and I think that's where a lot of people um, may enter the guiding business and decide that it's not for them because they entered it to be a fisherman and then they get there and that's the last thing they're doing they haven't touched a rod in months well some people embrace that role and some people don't the people that don't either just fight it their whole career and become bitter and they're not happy with the way their their anglers performing on the bow or whatever other people the greats the the true greats 
work on their communication skills. They work on being able to teach themselves how to do it, maybe left-handed, so they can understand the difficulties that this person seems to be having doing it right-handed, right? They've been doing it right-handed their entire life, but try to teach yourself to do it left-handed, and you, you now feel like you're a guy from Ohio that's never fished before, right? So the greats work on communication skills. The greats embrace the role of being the guide and and they're uninterested in being the fisherman on that day. There may be another day that they like to go out with their buddies and be a fisherman. That's great. But when they're a guide, they're a guide. And and they take that role very, very seriously. Um, so as you move into the television, it's the same thing. Like, there's now a, there's now a, um, a goal that has been has been um, um, communicated to us by people that know way more than us about um, production. Okay, this is what we're looking for. See how the light looks right here? See how you can see? See that's we need to be here, and you guys need to be over there doing exactly the opposite thing that you would ever do. Pulling into the sun to where you can't see, and but we need you to catch the fish. It's like, hmm, that's, that sounds tough. <laughs> sounds horrible. But, yeah, that, sound, that sounds tough. And, but, you know, you can do it if you do it, if, if you're very patient and you just realize, okay, well, we're probably going to blow 50 before we catch one. Fine. The, ca the camera guys are saying, fine, that's fine. It doesn't matter if you don't catch them. What does matter is that you catch the one and it's documented well. So, I mean, we've we've had lots of criticism over the years that we don't have enough fish in the shows. Oh, that's I, why I agree. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. And and yeah, we would like to have more fish in the shows, but sometimes it's sometimes it's pretty challenging to catch one under perfect conditions. And then when you throw all these other things into it, it can be I, I don't know. I, I look at it sometimes. And I'm like, man, I can't believe we caught what we caught because <laughs> there are a lot of challenges going into it. And that's a really good segue to one of the big questions I had when you first said, hey, I'm, I'm willing to do the podcast, man. We're just so grateful that you're willing to sit down and invest in guys who are kind of at the beginning of just trying to understand how all this works is, man, you've fished with so many different captains, guides. You fished with everything from the guy from Ohio who has never touched a fly rod before. Um, and one of the things I was really wondering was what are some of the common things that you see in great anglers what's some of the dna that those guys have that really makes them world class or the best of the best yeah well time on the water certainly um and you're right i have fished with when i first started when i first started um in my fishing career was a couple of years before river runs through it came out the anglers that you got were pretty good they had usually had a fly rod in their hand but when that movie came out you got everyone who saw it wanted to fish there and and that's where I was in Jackson Hole Wyoming and so that's a big tourist place blockbuster movie big hit you got everything you got people that had never fished before and they they think that that's the introduction to fishing great it was fantastic and we we introduced a tremendous amount of people to to fly fishing and in doing that you come up with a way that you can teach somebody how to fly fish in just a few minutes and get them out there and catch a fish within within a couple hundred yards of the boat ramp and um then in key west you know when money's tight i used to do a full day trip and then i used to pick up people from the cruise ship like you want to talk about people that never that don't know anything about anything get them off a cruise ship and yeah. and that is i mean i'm going from fishing fitz coker on the ocean side the most technical tarpon fishing that you can do to unloading all the fly rods at the dock and then going and picking up some cruise ship people and <laughs> there's a big difference there um the best anglers mm, i think the best anglers that i know are people that can do it all um, and this that immediately makes this group of people a very small group because like a lot of people got into flats fishing or, or whatever 
because of a movie the river runs through it or because of some cool thing that they saw and they start fishing by fly fishing which is fine glad to have them in the sport but they're limited in their in their understanding of just fish and bait and things like that and they are very skilled with a fly rod and that's great but they're missing out on what other anglers have as a foundation so some of the best fly fishing best fly fishermen i know for tarpon or for permit or bonefish or even trout or steelhead or whatever have a foundation in all types of fishing so they don't catch tarpon on bait anymore because they've literally caught thousands of them on bait it's not a challenge for them anymore it's not even interesting to them anymore so then they move to catching them on artificial lures and then they you know move to oh what's this fly fishing about and then they became a, a person that only fly fishes for tarpon okay great fitz coker is a great example fitz coker in my opinion is the best tarpon fisherman that has that has ever lived he is he's the best and he has more time on the water than anyone else and he's caught more tarpon than anyone else i would i would wager and he's done it in every way possible he's live baited for them he's chum for them he's sat he he's he's fished with every guide from Jose Wahebe to Ray Fetcher to Marshall Cutchin to myself to Doug Kilpatrick and ev- all the best guides that, that have ever gone to Key West, he's gotten time on their bow. He's picked up little things from each one of those people. But what makes him great is that he understands the fish so well, and he understands the fish so well because he's not one-dimensional in his thinking. He understands the bait. He understands what it what you would do to catch them in a certain situation he understands so much about the fish because he has a a a universal understanding of them and i think somebody that only fly fishes for them doesn't have that and the best anglers that i know some some of the best fly fishermen i know don't even like to fly fish they're great at it cal blumberg great He's great. Again, he's great because he understands the fish. He's, he, he can throw a spinning rod into a teacup from, without a splash from 60, 70 feet away. That's what he prefers to do. There's actually more skill involved in that than there is probably in, in throwing an 80-foot cast uh, with a fly rod. But I think the best anglers... A long, again, a long roundabout answer to your question. The best anglers first spend a lot of time on the water. Secondly, they have a, a universal understanding of the fish. They fished in a lot of different places. They fished with a lot of different techniques. They are not bound to one technique like a religion. They are open to, you know, okay, today's windy. Let's do this. Okay, great. Today is... I want more of a challenge. Today's windy, we're going to fly fish for them because it's windy. I think the best anglers also um, fish in tournaments. Um, Not all of them, but, but some at least have that experience. And I think the best anglers also fish with a tremendous number of guides in a lot of different parts of the world in a lot of different seasons of the year so again what makes a what makes an angler great is exactly what makes a guide great it's somebody that takes it seriously is trying to learn a little bit every single day and and realizes that no matter who you're fishing with or who you're talking to and what their experience level is that person can teach you something And so the best of the best of the best of the best have an open mind and are willing to learn from anyone and, you know, just continue to continue to try to learn. And it's that open mind kind of thing. As soon as you think you know it all, I I believe that you just shut yourself off to the possibility of learning anything else. So I don't see that 
attitude in great anglers. I don't see that attitude in great guides. I see that attitude in, in highly experienced people that aren't getting any better. Mm. That's, that's a really, really helpful. And, um, the whole idea of a full glass can't receive water. We've, mm. we've heard that several times. And I really like what you said about a, a well-rounded kind of holistic angler. It's kind of like the mixed martial arts scene <laughs> where like, you know, um, I, I did jujitsu for a year and really enjoyed it. And, you know, you got these guys that are really, really, really good at jujitsu. But if it's all they do and they step in that ring, they might get caught. They might get caught with right. somebody who's really good at boxing or, you know, fill in the blank. And so I think that's a really helpful a helpful kind of tad bit there of what what the holistic aspect of fishing can do for anglers. Yeah, but at the same time, there are people out there that are they they love throwing shrimp to bonefish or they love throwing crabs to permit. And that's what they like to do. And they have no desire to fly fish. Fine. And there are fly fishermen out there that they truly just want to go fly fishing. They have they they don't have any desire to do it any other way that's fine too whatever floats your boat man go get out there and have fun that's what we're all supposed to be doing it's the infighting and and one group saying that 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 it it's better than the other is what gets me i, I really don't like that at all you got a you got a guy on the boat that has never caught a permit on a crab in his life and he's he's telling you that what those guys over there are doing is wrong like how can you say that when you never tried it? Like, and I'm guilty of it too, man. That's how I started. I started fly fishing in saltwater, like, and didn't, I didn't even have a spinning rod. And, you know, I would say I'd rather catch one on fly than 10 on bait. Well, that was before I caught 10 on bait and catching 10 on bait is really fun. And it teaches you a lot. And so then you start thinking, wow, would I really rather catch one on fly than 10 on bait? But there are people out there that just, Look, they don't even get to go fishing that much. They go fishing maybe two or three times a year. They want to fly fish, and that's all they want to do. And you need to know enough about guiding that, and there needs to be proper communication in advance that if that's the person that you're taking fishing, even if it's way better and you know you could go take the guy over there and catch five permanent on crabs right now, it's so good, and they're floating in this channel, and it's so easy, and you know you've never caught one i can catch you five before the end of the day the tide's perfect everything's going to be great he literally has no you're going to lose that person as a client he has no desire to do that and as a good guide what i what i figured out somehow was that the communication leading up to that trip is so incredibly important to know that that's the person that you're dealing with don't even bring a spinning rod don't have crabs in the boat don't even mention it it's like it doesn't even exist because he don't want to hear it and the same holds true for you know when the fly fishing is off the charts and you got a bait fisherman you're like man if you just pick up that fly rod we could crush them and you know they don't want to hear it they that's not what they booked you for they don't want to do that so i don't know that that's um that's something that i think a lot of people encounter is that that customer that you know you you think you're opening their eyes but they already know and that's not what they want to do yeah and i've noticed there's some people who really like to work with like a master angler and they want to really hone in and, and target certain species with a fly and then you have other guys that obviously back to the guy that gets off the cruise ship you know like there's a lot of frustrations you're dealing with knots you're dealing with just you know little things like that but there is something really neat and i've heard several guys talk about this just about being on that boat when that person catches their first redfish or being on that boat when that person catches their first snook and the excitement they have and it kind of brings you back to a place when you were younger and you were first catching your first of whatever species and so i think that's a big component to it too that that a lot of guides enjoy they yes this is not an experienced angler but man i get to be on the boat in this person's big moment when they hook that first tarp in or fill in the blank there's no question about it it's the same as fishing with kids like i probably like fishing with kids better than i like fishing with expert anglers i mean there's that excitement every time with a kid and um you know when i had my own kids and started fishing with them a lot that really changed the way i fished a lot and um 
what I kind of wanted to do. And I, I like taking people with their, with their kids. And, um, you know, a lot of times sitting on the ocean throwing flies at tarpon is not fun for an eight year old, like not even <laughs> a little bit. They don't even think it's fun to look at them after a while. And, and I think that you're defeating the whole purpose there. And, and that's kind of the thing too, like the communication again, you got a dad that says, Hey, look, I'm going to, I want to bring my, my eight year old son and we want to fly fish for tarpon. Well, that deserves a conversation. Like, are you sure that's what you want to do? Because maybe could we do that? Like part of the time. And then here's, here's what else we might, you might consider like, let's get your, let's get your son out there and bend this rod like all day. And then day two, he's going to have a lot more patience and be, be more interested in what's going on. And you can work him up from catching, you know, small fish to larger fish and bigger fish and bigger fish until now he sees a tarpon come out of the water and you, you catch this thing on a fly rod. Well, okay. Now that's in his, now that's in his mind. Okay. I want to do that someday. And then you kind of work on, okay, well, it takes practice. And now you have to learn how to, how to cast this rod and, and then some kids are like, oh, well, if i got to do all that, I'm not interested. <laughs> that ties to that communication piece you were talking about where it's important just to, as a guide, have that, that communication piece with anglers. We've heard a lot of guys say, and I think it's attributed to Flip Pallet, but that when you're a guide, you're an entertainer. I'm not sure if you agree with that or don't, but you mentioned it as a therapist to this aspect where the relationship between the guide and the angler is really important. It's not just about driving somebody out to a channel and drowning well, a shrimp and catching that, a fish. Again, on. that's a difference between a, a, a great and a good is, is that the great understands that, yes, you have to be an entertainer and you are definitely an entertainer. And a happy customer is someone that, uh, that rebooks immediately. And you know, there's a, especially with young guides, there's, there's, there's this desire to, to want to return to the dock with catching the biggest or the most or, or whatever may not be what your customer wants. Like you can overdo it too. You can go out there and your customer catches, you know, two tarpon by 10 o'clock in the morning and he's 65 years old and his wife's back at the hotel and he's thinking, you know what, this is the greatest day ever. All I want to do is go home. I'm going to have the rest of the day to spend with my wife. We can do this again tomorrow. And it's, it's literally the best day of the year. A lot of guys, no, man, no, this is the day. We have to be out here. Well, maybe. But what's going to make that guy really happy is for you to listen to him and do what he says. And, man, if you want to go fishing after that, go on your own. Like, that'd be great. But, you know, I think a lot of people, I don't know, I did a How To Tuesday uh, little show just recently on this. Like, basically what makes a happy customer. But, you, you know, your, your, your job as a guide is to first entertain your customer and make sure that they're having the best day that they can possibly have. Uh, secondly is for them to learn something and way down the list is for them to, you know, catch the best fish of their life because you can go out with people and, and entertain them, learn something, you know, catch a couple of fish and they've literally had the best day they've ever had. And they want to do that not only tomorrow, but they want to book you for this time next year and they want to do it again. It, it has zero to do with whether they caught a world record fish or whether they, they, they caught, you know, even, even the biggest fish of their life. You went out, you showed them something, they had a great time, they want to do it again. That's a successful trip. Now, that goes into the difference between fishing tournaments and then fishing television shows. Like, what, what makes for a successful charter does not equal a successful fishing tournament. And you need to know the parameters around that before you go in. I mean, that's, that's really what it's all about. Like, okay, now we're in a fishing tournament and it doesn't matter how happy you are. We're not out here for you to be happy. We're out here to win this fishing tournament. Right. And that's where I think a lot of people don't like fishing tournaments is, is it sucks the fun out of it for them. 
Like, I want to sit here and have this cup of coffee and watch the sun come up. What are you kidding? We're going to be behind 50 boats. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that person is like, well, that's the whole reason I'm out here. The rest is just gravy on the cake, you know? Like, I want to watch the sun come up. Well, that person's probably not going to have a big future in the fishing tournaments. Okay, fine. Same thing with, with the with the television show. It's a different you're you're after a different goal, so there has to be a different process going in. And then for you to really be successful at it, I think you you just have to embrace that. Whatever that is, whether that's the charter business or whether it's taking your children fishing and all of a sudden, you know, tarpon fishing might be great, but you're catching pinfish with your four year old son and you know what? He's having a great time. What's he going to do with a 100-pound tarpon? Mm -hmm. uh, like, that's not the time. Yeah. Like, catch some pinfish. Keep catching pinfish. You can use them for bait the next day anyway. That's good. Just <laughs> kind of reevaluating the, the, what success is for each particular situation. And, and kind of as we kind of come towards a close, you know, with you, something I was wondering is on a bigger picture, you know, you got the podcast and television, you got your son and your family. I mean, when you think about what success looks like 20 years from now, what are some things that come to mind with that? Man, I don't know. I think, I think success is, I think success for me is, is really doing everything I can to help other people have success for themselves. And as a fishing guide, it's a very simple thing. And that's one of the things that I loved about guiding that I miss the most is that every day it's a very simple thing. You have someone that gets on your boat and your job is to show them the best possible day that that you can. And it's a gift. And and if you take it seriously, you can you can change lives. You can you literally can. I mean, I've seen it to where you show somebody a good time in a couple of years, they've now bought a house down there. They're spending all kinds of time. They change everything about their life because they had such a good time. Maybe they start fishing with other guides too. Great. But they, they had such a good time fishing with you that it changed their life for the better. Okay. It's a, it, it, you're not going to do that every time, but when someone gets on the boat, it's a very simple thing. You are trying to entertain them enough and show them the best possible time they could possibly have and have them st step off that boat and say, wow, that was way better than I thought it was going to be. And hopefully his wife's there too. And she goes, you know what? I didn't know what to think about this fishing thing, but I loved that. Are we going to do it again? Or maybe it's their kid or maybe it's their nephew or whoever is with them. Maybe there's nobody with them, but for them to step off and be blown away that they learned a bunch of stuff, they saw the most beautiful water they've ever seen, the guide was cool, he was funny, they, you know, they just had a good time from the moment they stepped on the boat to the moment they got off. And you know what they're going to remember a few years later? They're going to remember that day was fun. They're not going to remember we caught six fish or seven fish or that was 20 something inches or whatever they're going to remember man you remember those days we used to go to key west those were awesome that's good and and that's a successful trip so success in in life i think is is doing that in whatever if it's the podcast can you put stuff out there that really has an effect on someone can you help somebody to to get their story out there so that they can I don't know, do whatever they want to with it. Can you can you find and uncover these stories like you're doing? I mean, like what you guys are doing is really cool. Like you just said that you 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 did a podcast with Nat Raglan. Nat Raglan is a legend among legends. And to get his story and share it with other people is really cool. And if if that also motivates somebody to do something or start a business or I don't know whatever you know or or just entertain them as they're as they're going down the road that's a win i think and so you know with with everything as far as success goes i mean i don't know i don't even know what's next yeah i had that question we were talking about that on the drive out here uh 
but is there any show or podcast or kind of that that thing that you're still trying to get that you haven't got a chance to do yet oh there's there's lots and some of them have to do with fishing and some of them don't and some of them have to do with 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 things tangential to fishing but not not I mean there's so many and I think that if you don't have a I mean I'm 50 years old and if I felt like I had done everything I wanted to do I think it'd be a pretty sad existence um I don't I, I keep a list that is way bigger than anything I'm going to be able to accomplish or experience in this lifetime I have a list of places I'd like to go I have a pl- list of things I'd like to do of fish I'd like to catch of mountains I'd like to climb of things I'd like to do with my family I mean it's constant and growing and you know everything I learn I start thinking oh I'd like to do that too you know but you know I don't know I I there's plenty of people that I would love to have on the podcast well we've really we've enjoyed the podcast a lot and and that's been a neat thing I think as people who watched you on the television shows and the 22 minutes and 30 seconds of content (laughs) and you know maybe read articles which you know are another medium that you see a different side of people, but we've, we've enjoyed that journey and, um, it's been really neat and you still got plenty of time left to continue to keep chasing after oh, those things. Uh, let's hope so. <laughs> let's hope so. Especially if you keep carrying around that deck of cards and working out and, um, <laughs> well, that's not going anywhere. Uh, just a, a couple of rapid fire questions here at the end is, is there any piece of, of gear or thing that you've picked up in, in your travels recently that has just really either changed the way that you travel or changed the way you fish or any, any goods out there that, that people hmm. should look into? Hmm. Um, yeah, I really like my new, my new 24 yellow fin boat. Yeah. Everybody should have one of those. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Hey. Uh, yeah, that's changed. That's changed a lot. Um, Does that have a tower on it? Yeah, second station. That's nice too. I don't. I, I don't use the second station as much as. I mean, it, the rougher it is, the rougher it is up there. You know, like it's the, the closer to the deck you are. So I mean, it's great if it's calm. I don't like riding up there if it's rough. But um, I don't know. Um, I just came from the Miami Boat Show, and I got to say that it was not a year of just unbelievable innovations. I would think that if there was something that is changing anything about, I don't know. I don't. I don't. I think you stumped me on that one. I don't <laughs> think that I have anything new that I'm carrying around with me or doing anything with that has changed anything. I mean, I'm pretty. I'm pretty much. Uh, exactly the same i mean i start every trip the same way i throw in some workout gear pretty much the same things every time um and don't really deviate that much yeah don't fix what's not broken you know (laughs) sometimes you know every once in a while you you get somebody that picks up on hey i got this hook sharpener or hey i you know oh yeah i mean sometimes sometimes that is you you know you do find those world changing things and that's pretty exciting when that happens but lately uh, it really hasn't happened <laughs> sure is it, what are you most excited about with all your projects going on what's the thing that you're just this is what I, i'm i'm most floored about mm, well i i like the podcast a lot and i i think that i think that that has some real potential and i think that um maybe doing some live live events and speak more more kind of live events and speaking kind of things are are of interest um the podcast is definitely probably what i'm most excited about right now but that kind of goes into the whole um the whole digital world is is exciting to me the podcast is exciting because um i think i don't know what day it is today um like the like the 16th or 18th or something I think 16th 16th 16th. so uh last year on february 27th the first podcast of my podcast published i had no idea what to expect but i did commit to doing it for a year and so we're approaching that that year kind of thing and i i really didn't have any expectations i didn't know what to expect i didn't know I, i i mean this was a whole new venture for me on the first couple um, 
I didn't actually even like it that much because I was using a computer and this this scarlet thing and and uh, there was like an equalizer and that was just too much. It yeah. was way too much and I was trying to do it by myself and I ended up losing a couple of interviews and some of them weren't good and I just it was so distracting that I couldn't really focus on what I now find fun about it. Once I simplified the gear, came up with a situation that, that I can just carry around that little box and I can do it anywhere. Um, like we're just sitting out, out between a McDonald's and a, and a and Econo Econo right now. <laughs> it's a little different than the keys. Yeah. I mean, we are under this beautiful tree. This is yeah. a, a remarkably beautiful uh, old Florida tree with, with Spanish moss hanging from it. But the, um, the podcast is interesting because I've just received more feedback on the podcast than anything else that we've ever done. Magazine articles, photographs, television shows, um, movies, all of that kind of stuff. I have never, ever received so much feedback from people that are so into what we were doing or talking about. The next most feedback I would have gotten are probably the not videos. Um, and those have done incredibly well. And that was, that was kind of a fun little project. Those are awesome. Um, but, but, uh, the podcast is interesting because it's just a longer form. I get to sit down with people that I have a lot of respect for and want to learn from. And I have learned way more than I thought. So that's probably the most exciting thing, I guess. That's great. Are there, are there any closing thoughts or remarks or, or hopes that you want to see out of, um, you know, things like this initiative? Um, well, I, you know, the hope is that, that you, that I can actually put out some content that people find valuable and that, that is interesting to them and authentic and, and unique. And, um, the, the second hope is that, you know, I can continue to get these people that I really want to sit down with to, to sit down and, and tell their story in a way that people haven't heard it before. And I think if, if those two things happen, then I think that the project will, will speak for itself eventually. But I don't know. I mean, I just want to keep doing things that I'm interested in right now. It's a podcast next, you know, with as fast as technology goes, there could be something else, you know, soon, soon after this. And, and like, we're not on any kind of cutting edge on doing podcasts now. No. I mean, they've been out there for a long time. It's just, and I, and I thought about doing one for about two years. And like you, um, like we discussed before, I mean, it was kind of uh, uh, paralysis by analysis. I wanted to make sure I had all the right stuff. And I wanted to make sure that I had this guest list. And it wasn't until I just kind of jumped in and just started doing it that, that uh, it started coming together. And it, it's been way more more successful i mean if there's any success to it i mean it, it it's done nothing but cost me money uh and time so i don't know that it's could be considered successful in any way but it has been fun and i've learned a lot so if that's a measure of success then it's been great awesome well hey we're, we've had fun today and we're so grateful to have you on man thank you thanks. for making thanks, the time so. and good luck with this i thanks. think it's a really cool thing you're doing <laughs> awesome safe travels all right see you Hey guys, thanks again for listening to the Captain's Collective. Make sure to subscribe to our podcast and also hit up our newsletter on captainscollective.com. If you're enjoying the podcast, please continue to rate and share it with your friends. It helps us a ton. And we're excited for this spring because we've got some really great episodes lined up and we can't wait to share them with you. Thank you again for listening. This is the Captain's Collective. Captain's Collective.